Good afternoon and welcome to this webinar provided by the SMART Group. Today's presentation will be given by myself, Bob Willis, and I'll also be organizing today's session. Before we start uh, talking about uh, robotic soldering, I'd first like to introduce you to the control panel, which you have on your screen at this moment in time. Now, the control panel allows you to do a number of things during the presentation. First of all, you can open and close the panel by clicking on the orange button. This prevents it obscuring your view of the slides during the presentation. You can make the image on your screen or on your projection facility in your conference room go full screen by clicking on the blue button. Now, if you have any questions at any time during the webinar, all you need to do is type them directly into the control panel, as indicated here by the red arrow. Now, we'll deal with these questions at the end of the webinar session this afternoon, but sometimes it's better to type a question about a particular point or perhaps one of your colleagues in your conference room has a question about a slide. All they need to do is get you to type it directly into the control panel, and we'll address these questions at the end of the event. You will be receiving a copy of each of the slides as a PDF file shortly after the end of the webinar. Now, if you have any technical problems during the webinar, either visually or audio, then please ring one of the telephone numbers provided on your registration and reminder emails. You'll also need your webinar access number and access code, which was included on your email. It's not possible for uh, myself, the presenter and organizer, to assist you during a live presentation. Some people think I can multitask, but unfortunately, I can't do these two things at the same time. At the end of the presentation, we have a couple of survey questions on the event, the content, and other topics you'd like to hear us present on in the future. And as I previously said, we'll be sending out a copy of the slides as a PDF file um, shortly after the webinar this afternoon. Now, this is a smart group webinar, and I just want to draw your attention to other activities that we've got coming up. Uh, during the start of the year, and if you go to the Smart Group website, you'll find out about webinars, conference, and also one of our first wor workshops on PCB failures due to MSD and ESD. That's coming up in February. But I'll let you look at those at your leisure. A little bit about me, I've been involved in the electronic manufacturing industry all of my working life as a mechanical engineer, a process engineer, quality, and also working in failure analysis. Uh, I've uh, worked in contract manufacturing, PCB fabrication, and I've been fortunate enough to visit many countries around the world running training courses on a range of different topics associated with electronic assembly. That's a little bit about me, and basically my company now uh, provides training consultancy worldwide, as I have done for the last 25 years. Now, we're going to talk about uh, robotic soldering, um, but the project came about uh, that uh, I was asked to do, and we associate it with high temperature soldering. So we're going to talk a little bit about high temperature soldering as well as using uh, robotic soldering with conventional lead-free alloys. But the funding for this project did come from a project associated with specifically uh, with high temperature. It's just I suggested it was appropriate, in my opinion, to do some practical exercises, perhaps with techniques that weren't generally used in the industry. And out of that came two reports. Now, these reports are freely available that you can download, and I'll give you the link to that when I sent out the information on the slides from the presentation. So two reports goes into more detail, more technical detail than we have time to go through uh, together. Now, in terms of other books on high temperature alloys and high temperature soldering, uh, these are all the books that I am aware of in the industry. Um, and I've given you the titles the uh, uh, and obviously the editors of these books. The final book on the right-hand side is the most up-to-date. However, one of the things I would criticize about the books, they tend to talk about the components, generally speaking, uh, and not really the assembly processes related to the use of those components. So they're not really textbooks on lead-free or high-temperature soldering. 
um, but I mention them for completeness. In addition, um, Smart Group provides uh, a photo CD on photographs taken as part of this project. And we also have a set of wall charts for inspection and quality control of joints and also defects as well. So that's all of the sort of publications that I'm aware about within the industry today. So first of all, let's just talk about briefly about boards. As you know, and if you've listened to some of our other work at NPL, um, there is a requirement for high temperature alloys within the industry. And generally speaking, a lot of the through hole terminations have always been traditionally hand soldered and are still hand soldered today uh, by a lot of companies working in this particular area. Although there's obviously been an increase in the use of surface mount technology with higher temperature alloys, um, a lot of components are just not compatible with the temperatures now required. Typically, a high temperature application would be something that we would talk about 180 degrees up to now 200, and then we're talking now about 300 degrees Celsius uh, for ceramic-based uh, products. Now, these two examples I show you here are simply boards that exist and designs that exist from two component suppliers to allow you to evaluate components for a particular application. So they're all functioning boards. You can get access and information about those two, both from analog devices or Texas instruments. Moving on to a practical application, uh, one particular contract manufacturer in the US has highlighted three or four different products that he has produced over the years and looking at their specific applications it was designed for. And as you can see here, we've got the first two, a predominantly SMT technology operating at 150 and 175, and that's really still working with conventional materials and conventional uh, board substrates. But when you go up above 200 degrees C or at 200 degrees C, we're looking at polyimide substrates or moving on to uh, ceramic or metal backed printed circuit board assemblies. So that's a little bit about um, the component tree, the board technology, etc. Now moving on more to you know the subject of today, basically my project involved the assembly of polyamide substrates with a variety of different solder alloys. And I used robotic laser and iron soldering. We also included some boards with selective, you know, as a comparison of the technology used today. Uh, we used four or five different uh, solder alloys at uh, varying temperature ranges. Um, we did do some work, which is included in the report, on high temperature uh, polymer and epoxy materials as well. That's not discussed today because that was related to the SMT. We're concentrating on the through hole soldering with laser and uh, contact soldering today. We then took the boards and subjected them to uh, 200 degrees C for a thousand hours. Uh, we then inspected the boards uh, after 500 and a thousand hours and we did micro sections and all the normal tests you might associate with evaluation. And we also did testing on the substrate materials and how they stood up to higher temperatures. And we also include a little bit on conformal coating. Again, the conformal coating won't be discussed in this event today. Now, first of all, I'd just like to apologize to anybody who provided me boards and components for this particular exercise. Because after you've put the boards in 200 degrees C storage for 1,000 hours, they don't look too good afterwards. And this is just an example. And I apologize to the connector manufacturer and the four board manufacturers. But, you know, that's just an apology from me. The solder joints were still pretty good. Right. So for reference, the substrates, this is the build of the substrates I used for my test boards. And when you see the test board, you may be familiar with it because it's something I use for lots and lots of different exercises within the industry and my practical hands-on training. But we used four different laminate materials, all polyamide or polyamide type construction, specifically for high temperature applications. And they're all uh, produced uh, for me or with uh, Merlin circuit technology. Now this is the board. As I said, some of you may have recognized this because I use it all the time. We assemble the through hole components uh, uh, 
to the through-hole terminations you see on the left-hand side of the board um, in this 96-way uh, connector position. So it's a 1.6 millimeter board. It was a four layer construction, although we did do some thicker boards as well. And the SMT, as I said, we won't be discussing, but uh, those were just dedicated to 1206 chip components. And the reason for that is simply because we have a lot of data on shear force and reliability of solder joints on this particular size of component. So if you change the component technology, you may not have references to compare. Uh, the performance. This is just a, a photograph showing the sideways view of uh, this connector. Again, I use this for intrusive reflow, through hole, wave solder, selective training all the time. So it's just nice that we used it for through hole. And this is just one photograph of one of the joints on the SMT. Now, um, basically, the connector uh, is designed, and the design rules are the standard rules I use for pretty much anything I do. The hole to lead ratio is based on the pin size, so it's the maximum pin size plus ten thousandths of an inch gives you the finished hole size, the finished hole size, not the drilled hole size. And this is perfect for wave soldering, selective, hand soldering and intrusive reflow. But I just show you for completeness that we've got uh, two different connector pins. And one of the important things is that when you're considering automatic soldering, the computer that's driving the laser or the soldering iron tip is dumb. It doesn't know anything until you tell it better. So if you put in something which is different, i.e. in this particular case, uh, the pin shape or the pin size is different, that may have an impact, not on the quality, but it may have an impact on the yield from your process. So don't let purchasing companies change materials unless you give approval to do so. So in terms of design, I've just mentioned that really the design is standard that I use all the time. Um, with one exception, you can modify the pads and some companies do this uh, to actually have a landing pad. Um, so basically we're making the pad a slightly different shape. And the reason for this is if you are using contact soldering and you actually want a positive contact where the soldering iron tip lands on the pad area, and this is perfectly feasible to do, um, then you've got no problem with the tip damaging the resist, damaging the laminate. It's actually making contact with a surface. Now, again, some companies don't do it. I've done it, and I've done it without, and both can work very successfully. But it's a little trick, and it can work very successfully. You are limited, then, to the angle of attack, obviously, with programming your machine. The standard resist, the solder mask used is standard clearances, so there is nothing different there. You could have a bigger clearance if you uh, were using a large uh, lead to hole ratio, et cetera, or a large pin to pin ratio. Again, but standard design rules apply. If you can, and particularly when you're even hand soldering rather than automated soldering, uh, try and control thermal breaks. Now, a thermal break inside the board will have quite a significant effect on the soldering process, as many of you already know. So try and reduce the number of contacts between the through hole to the inner pad, also the connections to it. In this example, I just show you the termination inside the multi-layer board. And you can see here we've got the same hole to lead ratio, the hole size, but the pad is a different size. And also we've got a number of different uh, connections. So we've either got wide connections or thin connections. We've got a bigger gap between the pad inside the board to the copper area. So it will be much easier to solder or desolder the one on the right than the one on the left. Very simple and very straightforward. And as long as you can uh, uh, consider this, uh, it won't really affect uh, your uh, performance of your product, but it will make life a lot easier from a soldering and quality perspective. And just to complete this, what I've done is just shown this in x-ray. And I normally show this when I'm doing rework courses, just so the operators understand what's holding them back from doing a successful job, sometimes the design. Now, the boards we subjected to soldering and testing, we also subjected uh, to high temperature soldering as bare boards 
and looked at peel strength. And um, obviously, the robustness of the printed circuit board is very, very important. And this is a standard coupon that's used within the industry. And we did peel testing on samples to see what degradation may take place. And as you can see here, we have got a slight decrease in the peel force, but these are still within guidelines uh, that exist for standard laminate materials. Um, obviously, we're talking about polyamide at high temperature, but they're still within the range uh, which would be acceptable, even though they've dropped in temperature. You can see here uh, in the photographs on the right-hand side uh, the changes in the visual appearance between the copper and the laminate. Um, so there is changes based on exposure to high temperatures. Um, so something to be aware of. And this is just a, a graph to illustrate uh, the changes in force measurement. But the interesting thing that happened is that when you expose uh, large nickel gold boards like that to high temperatures for a long period of time, uh, you also start to have an impact on the nickel. Um, and this is sort of a like side effect, but you can actually hear it cracking during the peel testing. Right, we did thermal shock testing also on the printed circuit boards uh, to make sure that they would stand up to uh, high temperatures as well. And thermal shock testing is taking a board, measuring the resistance, and then seeing the change in resistance when you put it into water at ambient temperature, and then a liquidized sand bath at 260 degrees C. And both of the photographs of micro sections you see in this example on the center of the page here are after testing. Again, the quality of the boards was very sound with no problems associated with the aging. The reason for doing this is to see the effect of boards before and after and before and after soldering to make sure that nothing we've done has impacted uh, the quality of the boards. The boards were good to start off with and hopefully remain so. Now in terms of solder alloys, there are lots and lots of solder alloys out there in the industry uh, for high temperature applications and obviously traditional lead free alloys. And I show you some of the materials uh, listed here and you can see the temperature ranges that uh, potentially we may have to deal with. So it's important to uh, obviously decide on what you need to use and how you need to use it uh, for your particular application. And in the future, if there is an alternative to some of the high temperature lead bearing alloys, there might be modifications to the uh, Roche or REACH standards uh, to make them unavailable for use. But it, it just depends on what happens with legislation in the coming months and years because of Brexit and other things. So let's just look at and familiarize ourselves with traditional hand soldering. So this is a, an example of an unskilled operator uh, soldering two through hole terminations. This is me, but I guess as I train people, I must know something about it. Um, so we're just using a high temperature solder uh, and this is what would happen in the real world with through hole today. Some of the joints may be better than that, but they're perfectly good and meet IPC standards. Obviously, what we're interested in is good soldering and so good penetration. And you do tend to find that when you are soldering uh, with lead free alloys and the higher temperature alloys, that uh, it just takes time to get used to the soldering process and how much solder to feed in. It doesn't wet quite as well, um, just like traditional lead free. So be aware of the limitations and give your staff time to learn about the use of these materials. And of course, that will impact the performance of robotic soldering as well. Now, when we look at soldering, one of the tricks or one of the nice things to use uh, to look at soldering is uh, thermal imaging. And this is just an example, again, of uh, me hand soldering. And one of the nice things you can see here is that we're adding heat to the board every time we solder a joint. So one of the little tricks uh, with hand soldering with high temperature alloys or with robotic soldering is if you have one or two joints that are difficult to solder, skip them. So if there happen to be two joints within a run of joints, do the first two, 
skip the next two, and then do the last three, and then come back to those last two joints. It's not going to affect the speed significantly uh, with a robotic system, but you will have already preheated the board. It just makes life a lot easier. Think about the logic of that, and I'm sure you'll agree that that can be beneficial. So just a four examples of typical joints and when you look at the reports that uh, we produced uh, um, at MPL you'll see the visual appearance of all the different types of joints alloys etc that we produced on these projects now I just like to thank um, the companies that provided me equipment uh, for uh, this exercise and you can see here listed the suppliers of robotic soldering systems some of them uh, provide uh, only uh, robotic point soldering or robotic hand soldering if you like uh, some provide contact soldering and laser soldering again uh, my thanks to those who supported the project now one of the benefits of um, you know any robotic soldering system uh, potentially um, it has all these advantages that I've listed here and I'm not going to go through these because you can re review those yourself however one of the things to bear in mind is that um, you can get all the advantages, but you have to put the work in. So if you have um, an automated system, just like a pick and place machine or any other piece of equipment, you have to program it, you have to set it up, you have to optimize it, and then it will perform well. But if you don't optimize it and program it well, you'll get a problem. Also, when you're selecting a machine, um, it's fair to say you can buy some fairly inexpensive systems, but they won't have the flexibility that the slightly more expensive systems will have. So really take time to consider and also do trials yourself and get the supplier to do some trials with you to get the best performance so you can see the consistency and performance of the machine. One thing I would say is the most important thing, the most important thing, with any automated process is accurate PCB tooling and component lead position is very important because if you've got inconsistency remember that the computer is dumb until you tell it otherwise so all the advantages you can get with the systems that's fine but just think about the basics as well because that's what you really do need with an automated process so let's just mention about the basic steps that we go through with either of these soldering techniques. So with uh, robotic uh, point soldering, we're obviously assembling the printed circuit board and we want the component pin to be in a consistent position. Now the pin can uh, be bent to one side, so if it's auto inserted that's fine, as long as it is consistent in its position. That's the important thing. So it can be vertically positioned or it can be bent on one side as long as it's consistent because with a contact soldering it doesn't know any better. The soldering iron uh, would be brought into contact between the two surfaces and the solder or tin on the surface uh, will allow the preheating to take place. However, if you're looking for a faster throughput on any automated system, you've got to consider preheat as well. So not just putting all the heat in from a soldering iron, having preheat is beneficial and just a few seconds of preheat can be beneficial as you'll see a little bit later on. We then bring in the solder wire and this is exactly the same as we'll be doing with hand soldering. There really isn't any difference uh, in this process apart from it's all automated. And then we continue to feed solder into the joint to make sure that we're meeting the requirements of the specification. So if you're working to IPC uh, 610, then you've got guidelines for level one, two, and three within that standard. And then we remove the solder when we've got sufficient solder. Uh, we then remove the soldering iron and the joint is done and we move on to the next example. Now, there is one supplier who offers uh, contact soldering but also in, can incorporate laser for preheat which does work however uh, I think possibly uh, a simple preheat system for the bottom of the board in an inline process would probably be just as effective so 
we could take the board assembly, we could use a laser to preheat, and then we can go through the standard contact soldering process that we've already described, bringing the uh, tip to the surface of the joint, adding the solder, continuing to feed the solder into the joint until we've achieved the solder joint standard we require, remove the solder, remove the soldering iron, and allow the board to cool or pass on to the next solder joint. So fundamentally, as you can see, the process is pretty much the same. The key thing is making sure we're controlling temperatures, we're making sure we've got sufficient solder volume being uh, introduced into the joint to meet the standards you require. Now with laser soldering, it's slightly different. With laser, what we're doing is we're assembling the board in the normal way, but then we're introducing preheat initially, and this may be the point that we actually introduce the solder wire, and that laser then preheats the solder wire, and we're only talking about fractions of a second, but it heats the wire prior to introducing it to the joint. This can minimize uh, spitting during the soldering operation, just, with con just like with contact soldering. We then continue to add solder into the joint for the volume we require, and then we turn off the laser. So what I first want to do is show you two examples, just two examples, and again, you can see these uh, as videos. First of all, laser soldering um, of a printed circuit board, and we'll see more of these with different machines as we go through this. So you can see in this example, the wire being fed into the joint area after the preheating. And you can see it uh, being rotated and gone onto the second joint. So if I show the second video, this is contact soldering, quite a traditional machine uh, on a production line. Uh, so you can see the contact and then the solder wire fed into the joint area. So again, a typical example of the soldering process. But the engineering has to go on before this to make sure it's correctly set up and programmed. So just to step through once again, uh, we may, at the start of a connector, actually tin the tip, as you see in the first image. We then bring the tip to the joint we then introduce the solder to the joint areas you see in the uh, fourth and fifth image, and then we retract the solder from the joint area and remove the soldering iron as well to complete the joint operation. So I thought it was useful to show uh, in this first example an example of a practical application. This is a practical application of uh, one of my customers. Um, and you can see here the soldering iron tip making contact uh, with the pad. And I've, I've included another video here where we slowed it down. And you can see the solder wire being added into the joint area while the soldering iron tip is in contact with the pad surface. So this is you being used in high volume production uh, with many, many modules being produced. Now this is the laser soldering sequence. You can see the board assembly. This is my test board. The solder being brought into the area where the laser is heating the individual joint. The solder wire is slowly being fed in. We can see the fumes or the, uh, uh, the vapor coming off the joint. We can see with image four and image five, we're continuing to add solder. And then with image, the final image six, we're seeing the solder retract and away. You'll notice here in this example, there is quite a lot of flux residue present. You'll find with all of the high temperature alloys, um, there is quite a lot of flux. And of course, with a through hole joint, you've got more solder, hence more flux um, present. And consequently, inevitably, there's going to be more residue. Um, as you go to lower and lower residue cord wires, um, this can make generally the performance of the process uh, slightly less effective. 
but you can also introduce nitrogen, which has a benefit on the soldering process, but it also has a process benefit uh, slightly different than you might imagine, which we'll discuss in a moment. So this first example of uh, laser soldering is on, uh, again, one of my customer projects. And you can see this assembly uh, being soldered. And a nice example, you can actually see a slotted hole being soldered as well, as you see here. So again, nice example of uh, the laser soldering process being conducted on that sample. Now, as I said, there are lots of different machines, and I want to give you a flavor of the different machines without you know, talking about products in any way. But uh, this is an example, um, again, of a laser soldering system, but we're soldering from the bottom of the board. Um, some machine manufacturers can configure the soldering operation at the bottom of the board or on the top of the board, depending on the particular application. Uh, but here we're seeing uh, one of the test boards uh, being soldered, uh, again, using a laser system. Now, that particular piece of equipment, uh, I thought I'd include the programming, just so you've got a feel. I, obviously, you can take all of the data or the information from uh, Gerber files and convert them, or you can do it manually, as we used to do with SMT and, and through hole as well. And here you've got a map of the board design, which is just drawn in from Gerber data design files. And then we can program the individual solder joints, as you see here with crosshairs in the photograph on the right-hand side. You can then contribute the information specifically for the joint, the size, the hole size, the amount of fill you require, etc., etc. And this is just an example of one of the screens. And this is actually um, collecting data as the machine operates. And just showing you here, and what we're seeing here is just a very short video, but it's actually capturing that when it's doing the soldering operation while it's doing measurement of the temperature on the substrate. So again, some of the machines can collect data, uh, and that data then can be held for reference at a later stage. So a sideways view of uh, one of my one of my test boards. Again, uh, we can see the laser soldering operation. Uh, you can see the, in this particular case, uh, quite a lot of uh, flux present. But you can see perfectly full and good joints being produced. And by changing the core size, changing the solder material, um, and other soldering parameters, you can speed it up. But one of the things about speeding up a process is you are more likely uh, to get spitting during the soldering operation, whether it be laser or contact soldering. And it's not necessarily a function of the solder alloy material itself. It can be, but it's not necessarily always the case. So there's an example of HMP, high melting point solder being used, obviously a higher temperature than traditional lead-free alloys. Uh, here we see, again, um, contact soldering. and the solder being fed into the joint to get the volume required. And then just another example of uh, laser. And uh, I've included ones with different views just so you get a feel for uh, the way in which uh, the solder is being introduced and fed into the joint area. And hopefully that gives you uh, a good understanding. And then uh, iron soldering again. So the position the solder is added in uh, can be changed. You'll notice in this example, the solder is being fed into the tip. Um, the disadvantage of that is obviously spitting, but uh, spitting can be caused by other things, which we'll mention. Um, obviously, we train our staff not to introduce solder to uh, soldering iron tips, um, but in high volume production, certainly in perhaps um, mid-technology markets, um, the solder balls are not a really an issue. Speed and throughput is the number one. 
but if you optimize your process you can speed it up using other tricks as well which again we'll talk about as we go through so just a final example I think um, just showing drag soldering um, and what we've got here is a split soldering iron tip so we're introducing the solder to the solder well if you like uh, much like you do drag soldering with uh, surface mount but here you configured uh, a cut tip we're introducing solder to the reservoir and dragging it across the joints and um, you know that works quite well and in all honesty if you look at this and compare it with through hole soldering with selective soldering um, it's a comparable speed now the solder wire and really this is one of the things you really need to look at and consider and it's one of the things that I think personally a lot of people get wrong when they're looking at uh, automating a process and what you're looking at here is cord solder wire these are just two example videos I made a few years back just to show the cause uh, of the flux and most of you will be familiar with this um, as it oozes out across the surface it cleans the surface to allow a solder joint to form the solder goes into a liquid state and makes the joint but the reason I show this is it's that cord wire that we've got to think about when we're looking to automate a process now there are many suppliers of cord wire and there are lots of designs but one of the things you need to bear in mind first of all is that when you're using cord wire you want a material which doesn't spit or you minimize the amount of spitting and also you want to minimize the amount of flux residue if you can and also any spitting or residue that is coming from uh, the flux itself and the simplest way to test out uh, uh, a cord wire is do what I'm doing here all I've done is taken some paper I've got a hole in it I've put a soldering iron underneath it it could be a hot plate underneath but the soldering iron is less likely to burn the paper and then I introduce cord wire onto it and you're simulating the worst condition to see whether you're going to get any spitting or whether you're going to get uh, a lot of spitting actually from the flux itself with the soldering temperatures you're using now yes you can run it on a machine and that's the final arbiter but the bottom line is you want to evaluate the material and its performance before you start running it on a production line otherwise your production manager and all your operators are going to get upset now here's an example of what we can have as a problem and this has been nicely captured with some high-speed video and what this is is a comparison uh, between solder wire which has been indented and wire that has not been indented and what you looked at in a moment ago was the explosion of volatile material the cord wire um, if you heat it instantaneously or heat it very very quickly um, you've got pressure inside the cord wire and it literally will explode as you saw on that video clip so what we're trying to do is reduce this effect um, and you can see it has been achieved by indenting the wire so if you look to the uh, the left hand image you can see some indents in the wire now you'll find that most robotic systems now a days concentrate on indenting now indenting of the wire was a method of indexing the wire to the solder joint it was a method of feeding um, but then one company figured out that it was beneficial for other reasons and hopefully I'll demonstrate that to you and certainly it's something that I've seen increase across uh, the number of uh, suppliers within the industry and some perhaps didn't appreciate the significance of it um, but certainly they do now so indenting the wire is an advantage uh, to eliminate uh, spitting in the process now if you step back right at the very start of lead free introduction one company in Japan introduced V scoring of wire and they did it for the same reasons what they were trying to do is reduce the amount of spitting taking place so basically they made a, a, a small bench top system where they could indent the wire where you've got a single core 
and single core is important as well. And as you can see with this micrograph, uh, you're al allowing uh, the energy to escape before it starts spitting material onto the printed circuit board. However, that was specifically for a manual soldering operation, so they were producing reels of solder that operators could then use. So, you know, that's fine, but perhaps it wouldn't be appropriate for what we are discussing. Now, if you look at solder wire itself, you obviously get wire with different cores, and some of them are related to, to the supplier of those materials. But uh, if you're going to indent wire, it really, may I suggest, possibly needs to be a single core. Uh, if it's multiple cores, you might not find the indenting really gives the benefits. However, having three uh, or four cores uh, closer to the surface of the cord wire may actually uh, give a similar performance. I, I haven't seen that myself personally, so I've seen the, the single core wire certainly perform a lot better on this type of operation. And this is just an example, and I've just selected one just to illustrate the point of the wire and feeding the wire but indenting the wire. Um, I did an exercise also with uh, x-ray. It did seem a bit sad to x-ray solder wire but you could see the core, you could see the depth and you could see how the indentation was going into the flux core so it was quite useful but I haven't included it in this presentation because of the time we have available to us. So little experiment, this is Bob's simple way of testing wire. So basically what I've done is I've taken a ceramic plate, um, I've taken some of the wire from a supplier and I've reflowed it. So literally I've just lowered it onto the plate to reflow it. And what you can see here, or what you saw previously, uh, was spitting. Um, we've got two or three balls of solder which have been spat out on the ceramic plate and some very small satellites on this white surface. I use the ceramic because it's white, it's nice and clear, you can see and, and compare one supplier or one indent depth uh, between another and gives you a good reference for testing. So I've just pointed out a couple of the, uh, the balls with these red arrows. The second example, what I've done is we scored it, so the wire actually is scored as you can see and I'm feeding it in possibly faster than I did before and you can see these scores nicely and we've got no residue, we've got no balling which is the whole point of optimizing this particular part of the process. And here what I've done is, uh, again I've done the same thing and I've orientated the wire uh, so you can see where the flux is actually coming out of the wire. However, I've done it in a third way. And in this video, what I'm showing you is the indented wire. It's being heated up uh, in a controlled manner, but I'm not reflowing the wire. And the reason is just to show you the material coming out of the indents uh, to the surface. And as you can see, there's no spitting there. So that was just below reflow temperature for that particular wire, which then didn't allow uh, any energy to escape from that surface. So, you know, that's one of the process tricks we need to adopt. Now, when we look at contact soldering, so soldering iron with a robot, um, one of the important things, obviously, I, I believe is and can be beneficial is the use of nitrogen. And I'm not necessarily talking from a wetting point of view, but I'm talking from a protection of the tip point of view, um, so the tip remains uh, cleaner. Uh, there's less buildup of burnt flux on the surface of the tip to remove, but also there is also a benefit um, during the soldering process if we feed the nitrogen and control the flow rate. And certainly with experimentation, uh, certainly I've been able to modify the process and not in seconds but in parts of a second but in an automated process if you save half a second on every single joint that's a lot of seconds at the end of the week and the point here is that if we control the nitrogen flow and the temperature of the nitrogen and we can improve the throughput capability of the process um, but you just got to be careful because you need to know what the temperature is of the nitrogen being fed through of the soldering iron tip or fed onto the surface. And as in the previous example, you can see where the nitrogen was flowing around the tip. So use 
um, a camera system um, to optimize your process. Again, it's a, a fairly you know, typical tool that's available to us today. That's experiment. There's not a one setting fits all. You have to run your process, monitor your process, and then adjust the process to optimize for your throughput. Again, it's just something that takes a little bit of engineering time, but that's what engineers are paid to do. Now, in terms of nitrogen or non-nitrogen or benefits of different finishes, one of the other things I've used uh, is um, test boards. And what I show you here is a sort of more elegant way of looking at spitting, if you want a more elegant way of spitting, and also a way of looking at uh, wetting. So you can solder to a copper board, like I show in the, in the, uh, on the left-hand side. We could uh, solder to a copper board, an OSP coated board, um, as we see with a pattern on to look for spitting and how far the ball will spit out from the surface. And the final board on the right-hand side could be used for degree of wetting. So we can introduce nitrogen into the process and see how far the solder wets from a specific point. So you can measure uh, parts of a millimeter away from the area of contact. So that's the way I would choose to do it. Multiple samples on a test coupon, set a little program up, and that allows you to evaluate three or four things. Just to show you an example um, of the same basic process being conducted um, uh, with a system in Japan, uh, what they've done is taken copper coupons, copper OSP coupons, uh, in a carrier plate and introduced the soldering process with nitrogen. As you can see, there's a difference between those two materials. Um, there's a difference between, but using the same parameters. I kind of think that uh, the, uh, the wedding pattern that I showed on the previous slide is probably a little better personally, but then again, I would say that, wouldn't I? <laughs> but the point I'm making here is we've got other things we can optimize in the process as well. And printed circuit boards uh, can be a variable uh, if you don't check and pick the right surface finish from a soldering point of view. Okay, soldering iron tips. Um, obviously, you want to buy tips from a good supplier. You want consistent control of the soldering iron temperature or being able to adjust it very, very quickly. But just think about the mechanics. A tip is making contact with uh, the joint area on your printed circuit board. Now, if the tip relative position changes, then your program is meaningless. You've got to update your program. So a key thing with any soldering iron, which is uh, aligned to or uh, mounted on a robot, uh, the soldering iron tip needs to be in exactly the same place every single time. When you put a new soldering iron tip into the system, the tip needs to be in the same place every single time. Some systems, cheaper systems perhaps, don't do that. So you've got to change your process parameters if you have to update a tip or a tip wears out, etc. So just think about this as a, a method or think about what you need to consider when looking at systems in the marketplace. Now also, um, we have cleaning systems and most systems provide cleaning systems. Obviously with uh, laser, you would have to clean the optics on your laser system. Um, but as there is no physical contact with the joints, then you won't be actually cleaning the tips. And there's a couple of examples. You've got sponge cleaners, brush cleaners, and you've got what I call swarf cleaners, uh, personal opinion, um, or just using simply an air jet. And the idea is to blow off the oxidized material or the buildup of flux residues on the tip. So again, these are available from all the different suppliers, and it's certainly worth having a system um, with a contact uh, soldering iron system, and you just got to evaluate which you which you believe gives you the best performance. So I've talked about the soldering systems. I want to just show you an example. This is my test board uh, being soldered with HMP solder and tin silver solder. So both high temperature alloys. One is uh, more is harder, more robust, uh, less ductile. One is a very more ductile material um, being used on printed circuit boards. And every one of the 
um, boards we assembled with these two alloys, um, the soldering performance was very, very good. You've got an indication of through foot speed, which is, as I said, you know, typical for a connector of this size. You would tend to use um, a selective nozzle, which is a mini wave rather than individual joint nozzle because the thermal demand getting energy into the board assembly even though you've got preheat that is a more uh, robust process uh, may I suggest an easier process to define rather than doing individual solder joints no so all of the joints we made uh, using contact soldering laser soldering and selective and bear in mind there was a lot more laser soldering and uh, contact uh, uh, robotic soldering we just use one process for the selective soldering for comparison. Uh, we looked at the soldering performance and you know all of the performance we got easily met IPC standards and IPC level 3. That really wasn't uh, too much of an issue. Obviously if you're using thicker and thicker boards um, that may be something you've got to re-look at and re-evaluate but uh, with preheat prior to these tools being used in an inline process which is perfectly feasible and, and fairly fairly cheap to implement in all honesty um, that could improve um, your whole filling if that is a particular issue um, we also looked at all of the solder joints after storage uh, so 200 degrees C for a thousand hours um, and we looked at the intermetallic formation and it ranged from five microns up to uh, uh, the maximum thickness of 16 microns now obviously we're I'm talking about different alloys here so the um, the thickness of uh, the thickness formation will be dependent on the alloy obviously the starting point um, but it just gives you an idea and typically if you look at a tin lead joint in this sort of situation it would be just under four microns something like that um, but if you were trying to store it at 200 degrees C, it would be a little difficult, as you might imagine. But all of that data is available in uh, one of the two reports that I provide the link for you to download. Now, we also did force measurements, pulse strength measurements, um, because um, there is sometimes a tendency, uh, if, you, if you don't spend a bit of time getting the process parameters right, uh, to overheating joints and that can happen with contact soldering or laser soldering as laser, laser soldering is a non-contact method um, and we don't sense if you like um, the energy going into a board you might find more overheating in that situation however you should do your temperature profiles check it with an infrared camera in the same way as you would do temperature profiles for reflow soldering but the point I'm making here is that when we do pull force measurements um, you can see the barrel coming out of the board so you're pulling the barrel out or you're pulling the pin out of the solder joint so the aging phenomena that takes place through storage or the process that we use can impact the way in which the solder joint actually separates now none of the solder joints actually failed but it does affect the way in which they separate and the actual final result so these are just a couple of examples uh, I've slowed it down the videos uh, just so you can see um, where the pin pulls out or the barrel pulls out of the plated through hole and you've got some force measurements some examples of some force measurements uh, before and after uh, testing of joints just for comparison if you want to compare uh, some results that you might actually uh, get yourself now a few examples of defects now again in the report there's you know a lot more examples of some of the defects we experienced or saw um, but I've just included a few examples here so first of all uh, board damage or burning of the resist and what this is is contact with the soldering iron tool so basically the soldering iron tip is contacting the board surface rather than the joint surface and this may be a programming error it may be um, the the machine its physical operation using the boards of reference so it's found the height of the board and it feeds back to the system um, but really the tool should not contact the resist surface if 
you want flexibility, remember that design trick I showed you earlier on. If you have a, a pad extension, um, that does give you the flexibility to be able to uh, bottom out, bring your tip into contact with the board, um, and again, you're there on a surface all the time. And certainly from manual programming perspective, that's a lot easier to do also. Excessive flux. Um, certainly, if you look at the materials in the marketplace, the different cord wires which are available for this particular application, um, you will find generally more flux. You will find generally more flux, just like you have with hand soldering um, with higher temperature alloys. And you've got to decide whether this is suitable or not suitable, whether you need to clean or not clean. But if you then also look at uh, the use of nitrogen, uh, that may improve your process and also allow you to use uh, materials with a lower flux content. Uh, inconsistent solder volume. Um, you, can, <laughs> you can see here that um, we've got a perfectly good joint on the right and on the left we've got um, you know, the first day at soldering school. Um, but this can actually happen on an automated process because it is pretty consistent as you see. And what's actually happening here, uh, sometimes when you're doing a robotic soldering operation with contact methods, a soldering iron, you feed in solder and as the soldering iron tip pulls away, there's more solder left on the tip. And then when you go back to do the next joint, you're adding in the solder and you've already got a large reservoir on the tip. So that's why you get uh, uh, a perfectly good joint, an excess joint, a perfectly good joint, an excess joint. Um, so just to a nice example of uh, some of the sort of different uh, appearances you can get. Again, we can correct that, but again, it's a practical example of what we've seen. So what I've tried to do in this particular session, um, as well as uh, introduce uh, Bob Willis, the scuba diver, uh, using robotics, um, I've tried to talk about the techniques. I've tried to talk about my experience so far with setting up processes, some of the key things to look out for in the process and process settings. So any questions? Now, all you need to do is type your questions directly in to the control panel uh, on your system at the moment, and I'll do my best to uh, answer them for you. We've had five questions already, so that's fine, but if you'd like to type a question in, uh, please do so while I'm answering the questions we've had posed so far. First question, can you use robotic soldering for uh, flexible circuits as well as rigid circuits. Absolutely. Um, a flexible circuit, if you're going to automate it, um, you know, whatever build, whatever design it is, just needs to consider how it's going to remain in place and flat on the board. So if it's a flexible circuit, not a rigid flexible, um, you've got to use a pallet. And uh, I've had some experience of running pallets with flexibles, i.e. a piece of paper, basically. Um, I haven't had practical experience with uh, doing contact soldering robotics, but there's absolutely no real problem because the flexible becomes rigid when you put it on a pallet. The disadvantage of pallets is they cost money, but if you want to look at uh, seriously doing flex, then you have to invest. There are two, you can, you can uh, have a pallet which holds the flexible flat and is heavily tooled. You can use what I call a sticky back plastic pallet, which was developed uh, in Japan quite a few years ago uh, for uh, uh, flexible circuits. And basically it's a sticky pallet, like double-sided tape, but without any residue. Um, that's supplied by a couple of companies uh, in the UK. Um, so you've got traditional pallets or sticky back plastic. Um, the sticky back plastic pallets last about 500 operations before they have to be uh, cleaned or dumped. Um, that sort of feedback that I've had from production lines in Japan. Next question, uh, is there a significant difference with cord wires, uh, with laser and contact soldering? I've suggested to you in this presentation, yes there is, um, please try out materials. What I was very surprised at uh, with working with uh, the different suppliers of machines is that um, uh, some of the solder manufacturers have done a fabulous job selling to them. No disrespect. Um, but when they tried out other materials, you know, other suppliers' materials, because I wanted to try different materials, 
they were quite pleasantly surprised. Oh, this is a good material. We should try this. And I'm thinking, well, hold on. You're the experts. You should be trying all the software wires. And that's no disrespect to anybody, but I'm just surprised that they found a material, it worked, and that's what they recommended, whereas they hadn't tried other materials. So, so try the different materials. There are lots out there, but remember the indentation, I think, is significantly important. I think the control of nitrogen flow and, and how the nitrogen helps the, the heating process and preheating process is particularly important as well. Next question. Did you solder any boards other than nickel gold? Uh, no, I didn't. Um, and the reason for that is simply because we were going to store the boards at high temperature. And I know that if you take, let's say, OSP, if you take tin, you take uh, uh, um, uh, silver boards and store them at high temperatures, they don't look very pretty afterwards. And it's difficult to figure out um, the reaction with the joint as opposed to the reaction with the heat. So uh, the nickel gold does is very robust. And nickel gold has been used for many, many years as a surface finish for high temperature applications. Um, so you know, that's one of the reasons why I took a simple option of using that. Uh, next question, did you get any feel for different suppliers of tips? Um, no. Uh, because we're doing a relatively few boards, each one of the trials or tests were somewhere between five or ten boards uh, for each piece of equipment or each material. So you couldn't really do a comparison in that way. It's something you'd have to do over a longer period of time, I would suggest. So, um, you know, sorry, no, I, can't, I, I can't actually answer that particular question. Okay, uh, next question. Um, uh, hi, Bob. When soldering with a laser from the bottom side of the board, is it necessary to retain through-hole component pins? Do components float? Uh, no, I, I honestly uh, didn't see any evidence of floating, but it depends obviously on the, uh, the, the size or the weight of the component. Um, you know from your own experience, I'm sure, that if you jo just joggle preform a component on a a, a flow line assembly, the lighter ones will move. If you joggle them and they clip into position, then they're not going to move. Uh, they're going to stay there. But that's a preforming operation you have to do. It adds to the time. It works very well, but it's something you have to do. Obviously, with the my most experience is obviously with the connector, and obviously the connector is not really going to go anywhere because it's pretty heavy. And as you notice, it also had hold down features on the end. And the reason for using the connector as opposed to any other component, it's all about uh, inspection. Um, so yes, I could use some different components, and that would be great in the future possibly. But if you, if you solder a connector, you get lots of pins. I can then put that into a micro section where I get lots of solder joints for minimum amount of effort of producing one micro section. So I always tend to use connectors where I can because I'm getting more value for my effort, if you know what I mean. So that's, that's the reason behind it. Um, but they, 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 they shouldn't really float from a laser. Um, but certainly, if you're using contact soldering, uh, that's a different matter on the uh, underside of the board. One other question. Um, did you get any problems with delamination on any of the printed circuit boards? Uh, no, um, I did see some evidence of delamination after aging, but uh, I would suggest uh, that was not anything specifically to do with uh, successful soldering. So any of the boards that we, we were put really happy with in terms of quality of soldering, successful soldering, with no evidence going in of delamination or damage to the board, then there was nothing extra seen after uh, the aging process. Most of the aging seemed to be uh, on the surface, as you saw on the first photo, uh, photographs I showed you. So um, just a reminder, if you have any questions, just type them directly into the control panel, as the six or seven people have already done so far. And I do my best to answer the questions for you. While you're thinking up uh, any more questions to come in, um, I'll uh, just mention about um, the training material, which is available from Smart Group. That's the photographs and also the poster sets, and also the other events which are coming up uh, from Smart Group. We've got uh, webinars, 
we've got a conference on cleaning contamination and we've also got uh, ESD and MSD uh, failure modes a workshop that's coming up in February so um, just to wait a few moments to see if there's any more questions coming in uh, and again I'll be sending you a copy of the slide shortly after the webinar and a link to the two reports on high temperature and high temperature plus robots and contact soldering okay it looks like we're done with questions all right, well, what I'd like to do is thank you all for attending uh, this uh, smart group uh, webinar on uh, laser and contact soldering. Hopefully you found it interesting. Hopefully you found it practical. That's what I like to do. I like to get my hands dirty. I like to do the practical stuff um, and hopefully provide some tips which will help you if you're evaluating or running systems at this moment in time. So thank you very much for attending the webinar once again and good afternoon to you all.